Hello everybody and welcome to this A-level chemistry question walkthrough video about halogenoalkanes. As ever, the questions are available to download in the chat and I will show you my thinking behind the questions in blue as I work through and explain what's happening in each situation and the answers that are going to get you the marks will appear in green. When a question about halogenoalkanes comes up, it's really common for there to be a mechanism aspect to it because actually there are two types of mechanism that happen in halogenoalkanes. There is elimination and nucleophilic substitution. So I've picked a question that actually covers both of these. This first question says that we've got an organic mechanism where we convert 2-bromopentane with ethanolic potassium hydroxide into two structurally isomeric alkenes. So first of all, we should recognise that that's actually a really generous style of question. They've told us that an alkene is being produced. Very occasionally you get no clue as to the type of product that occurs, and they maybe just tell you that ethanolic potassium hydroxide is reacting with 2-bromopentane, and they expect you to work out what's going to happen. And your main clues are the fact that the potassium hydroxide is dissolved in ethanol, they might also say that it's warmed gently. And what we're meant to deduce from that is that the ethanol will be acting as a solvent to make elimination happen. And you need to remember that if it's an ethanol or an alcohol solvent, elimination is going to happen. And sometimes, as I say, you have to spot that clue yourself. But you've actually got a second clue, which is that we're being shown that an alkene is being produced, which is very nice. And so in terms of this reaction, Clearly it's an elimination reaction because we're starting with the halogen in the halogenoalkane and at the end there is no halogen here so it's gone and it's not been replaced by anything else so it's not been nucleophilic substitution so this mechanism is elimination and so we've been asked to name and outline a mechanism so we'll get one mark showing that it is elimination and then we've got three marks for the actual mechanism and so the thing to be careful of here is to make sure that you're making the right product. So we're making pent-2-ene and that's really important because the bromine when it's in the second position as I've shown here when I've drawn the full displayed formula of 2-bromopentane is the bromine is going to leave. When you draw a halogenoalkane mechanism the carbon to bromine bond always breaks and in fact one of the halogens will always take the electrons from the bond. That's almost a gimme in terms of a mechanism with involving a halogen. But what that will do is that will leave the carbon that was bonded to the bromine with only three bonds, so it needs to get those electrons back somehow. What it does is it takes those electrons from one of the carbon to hydrogen bonds on an adjacent carbon atom. It's really important that you recognise it's an adjacent carbon atom. So it's not carbon number two, it's carbon number one, or it's carbon number three. And so what you need to recognise is that we're making pent-2-ene, and so the double bond is between the second and the third carbon atoms in the chain, and so we have to take that hydrogen atom away from carbon number three. And that pair of electrons goes into the double bond, which means that carbon number two has now got back up to its four electrons in that space in the middle and its four covalent bonds. Now that hydrogen won't just up and leave by itself. What has to happen is the potassium hydroxide, or more specifically, the hydroxide ion, has to act as a base and accept a proton or a hydrogen ion. And that's where our third curly arrow comes in. We're showing that hydroxide ion taking the hydrogen away from the halogenoalkane. So overall, three marks for this mechanism, one for each of those arrows. And then we've got one mark follow-up question. Draw the structure of the other structurally isomeric alkene produced when 2-bromopentane reacts with ethanolic potassium hydroxide. And this is what I was saying before in terms of we have a choice. We could take a hydrogen from carbon number three, which we did in the previous question, or we could take a hydrogen from carbon number one, which we didn't. And the reason that we didn't do that is it would have put the double bond in the wrong position between the first and the second carbon. So that's what we need to do here. We need to show the structure of pent-1-ene just for one mark. It says draw the structure, so you could go structural formula or you could go displayed. I would generally advise displayed. And then the follow-up question would sometimes be, aha, potassium hydroxide now in aqueous solution and that would be a nucleophilic substitution 
about making an alcohol. On this occasion, they've actually changed the reagent that's being added to our halogenoalkane. On this occasion, it is ammonia. And we've shown that the ammonia starts off separate and becomes part of the organic compound at the end. And so what that must mean is the ammonia has taken the place of the bromine because it's here now and it's gone in the product. So the bromine has left the compound and so it's been substituted. The ammonia has come in and taken its place. How has it done it? Well, it's done it because the ammonia has got a lone pair as part of its structure and that lone pair is attracted to the electron deficient carbon of the halogenoalkane. So in other words, the ammonia is acting as a nucleophile. And therefore, for our first command to name a mechanism, this is nucleophilic substitution. And then the second command to outline a mechanism must be the rest of these marks, must be four marks for what's happening during this mechanism. And that tells you it's slightly more complicated than some nucleophilic substitutions, because sometimes nucleophilic substitution, for instance, with a hydroxide ion, is likely to only be two marks. And that's because there's only two curly arrows and there's only one step. Whereas here, there are going to be four marks worth of content, which must mean this is the more complicated nucleophilic substitution, which has got three curly arrows and two steps. The first two curly arrows are common to all nucleophilic substitution. The first thing that you need to do is show that nucleophile from its lone pair, remember the curly arrow has to start at the lone pair, forming a new bond to the electron deficient carbon, which is bonded to the halogen. And that's what this first curly arrow represents. Remember, the second curly arrow is always the carbon to halogen bond breaking. So we start the arrow at the bond, in the middle of the bond, make that really clear. And then it points to the halogen, which is taking the pair of electrons from that covalent bond. That's the first two marks, one for each of those curly arrows. Once that has happened, we need to draw the second step, which is an intermediate. And the intermediate product is going to be forming a, an, an ion, because if you think about it, there's two reasons why that makes sense. One, the bromine has left taking both of its electrons from that covalent bond with it, so that will be leaving as a bromide ion, which is negative, which means we can't have something making a negative without a positive being less, left behind. The other reason why it needs to be a positive intermediate is that that nitrogen began with three covalent bonds, and in our intermediate, you can see it's now got four, three to the same original hydrogen and one to the carbon. And so its electrons are spread more thinly than typical. It's using them to form an extra covalent bond than normal. And so it's going to be positively charged. And the third mark for this mechanism is actually going to be for the structure where we recognize the positive charge. Then the final mark is for saying, well, at the end, the nitrogen, first of all, has only got two hydrogens attached to it and it doesn't have any charge at the end. So we need to remedy that with our final curly arrow. And what the nitrogen does is it takes both of the electrons from its bond to one of the hydrogen. It doesn't matter which of the three bonds you take, but that nitrogen takes both of those electrons away and restores its neutral charge and the hydrogen leaves as a hydrogen ion. You don't need to show the formation of the organic product. I haven't done here because we've got it in the equation, but unless they say, show clearly the structure of the organic product, they don't care, they don't want to see it. Now, just as an aside, we never show the curly arrow for the removal of that hydrogen, but if you were to show it, you must be absolutely clear that it is a second ammonia that takes that hydrogen away which is why sometimes questions say, give a condition for this, and the condition is excess ammonia. And the overall equation for the reaction of a halogenoalkane with ammonia is to include a two in front of the ammonia. And so you make your amine, in this case, this is propyl amine, but you also make ammonium bromide or ammonium chloride, depending on what the equation is, as your second product. And then the final part of this question is asking us about CFCs, which is another commonly occurring part of the halogenoalkanes topic. Sometimes they begin by showing you a complicated CFC and getting you to name it. They haven't done here. They've shown us a CFC, but they've named it for us. 1,2-dichloro-tetrafluoroethane. And you don't need to number the fluorines because they've numbered the chlorines and all the remaining spaces are taken up by the fluorine atoms, which is why that hasn't actually been named. If, say, two of the fluorines were replaced with hydrogens, we would absolutely need to add numbers. 
And then the question moves on to tell us that the CFC can break down in the upper atmosphere forming chlorine radicals. And we've been asked to give an equation for this breakdown. And so this is homolytic fission. And what that means is when the bond breaks, and it's going to be one of these bonds between the carbon and one of the chlorine, so it could be either end, it doesn't matter. What's going to happen is that bond is going to break in the presence of ultraviolet light and both of the atoms are going to take one of those electrons each. So homo meaning the same, so they've got the same share of the electrons and lytic meaning to be broken. And so this is going to break equally. And so that's why we get free radicals at the end of it. So you need to make sure that you put the dot on the chlorine that is going to do the, you know, cause all the problems with the ozone layer in a moment. And then what we also need to include is the fact that the CFC that's left without that chlorine is still a free radical. And you need to make sure that the free radical goes in the correct position. So on one of the carbon atoms, basically, you can't put the dot randomly somewhere in the formula. It needs to be on one of the carbon atoms. Either of the carbon atoms can lose the chlorine, but the free radical needs to go onto the carbon atom that has lost the chlorine. And then finally, we've been asked to give two equations to show how chlorine radicals catalyze the decomposition of ozone. So clearly, there are two ways of approaching this. One is just to memorize the equations. And if you've got a good memory, brilliant. If you find that difficult, here is a strategy that I suggest you use. First of all, chlorine-free radicals are being used. We know that. So let's start with putting the chlorine-free radicals in. Secondly, they're telling us it's catalyzing the decomposition of ozone. That's a really lovely clue here that the chlorine-free radicals are acting as a catalyst. Sometimes they ask us what the role of the chlorine-free radical is, but they're telling us here that it's a catalyst. And so what that means is, yes, we're using chlorine-free radicals, but they're going to be remade because one of the definitions of catalysts is that they don't get changed by the reaction that they're catalyzing. So we've already got two of our eight formulas in these two equations because what we need to have now is we need to say right well the ozone is going to be decomposed so that means the second formula is going to be O3 and you need to remember so obviously you can't just work it all out but you need to remember that the overall decomposition is ozone is turning into oxygen and so what that means is one of the products of the first equation is a molecule of oxygen and then when we keep track of the atoms, you can see that we had three oxygen at the beginning. We've only got two so far on the right hand side. And so the second product must contain that chlorine and an oxygen and that free radical can't disappear either. And so we need to have the free radical on the oxygen of the ClO free radical. And that's the formation of the second free radical that appears in these equations. Now, the overall reaction for ozone turning into oxygen doesn't have any free radicals in it. So that ClO free radical that's just formed needs to have a role in the second equation and it needs to get used up. And so in the second equation, we start by putting that free radical back in again and we think, OK, well, we're making our chlorine free radical at the end. So where's that oxygen going? that one single oxygen that currently is part of the free radical. Well, what happens is it reacts with a second molecule of ozone and it makes oxygen. It can't just make one oxygen because we've got four oxygen on the left hand side. It's going to make two oxygen molecules, so 2O2. And so both of these lines are one mark each. If you drop the free radicals, you will lose that mark. You need your free radicals to be in the correct position on the ClO as I've shown here. A final tip is that you can remember what the overall reaction is for the decomposition of ozone. It is 2O3 turns into 3O2. So actually a really nice and simple equation. And what you can see hopefully is if you take this equation and this equation and you add it together and you get rid of all of the free radicals, in other words, the things that appear on both sides of the equation. So we've got a chlorine free radical as a reactant on the top and a product on the bottom, and the ClO free radical appears as a product on the top 
and a reactant on the bottom, they all cancel each other out in terms of adding the equations together. And so we are left with the overall equation for the decomposition. So we can have that confidence that we've drawn the correct equations because they add together and simplify down to what we know is the overall reaction. Okay, that's the end of this question and the end of the video. Hope it was useful. I'll see you again soon.